Today I'm going to talk about using the Google Maps uh, developer platform with a new open source framework called DeckGL, which was developed actually by the uh, engineering team at Uber. So my name is Alex, and I'm a developer advocate on the Geo team, so Maps, basically, at Google. Uh, that's my Twitter handle at the bottom, so if you have any questions you know, about Maps, or I actually have, I have a long history in like JavaScript, open source, all that good stuff. So please feel free to ping me if you, if you have any questions afterwards. I realize that my name is very long and hard to spell and pronounce. So you can kind of universally find me online on GitHub and everywhere uh, by this angry little dog in the beer box. That is my dog. Her name is Allie. She is exactly as pissed off as she looks in that photo. <laughs> Before I kind of get into, into the actual like, implementation details, I'd like to start this talk with kind of a basic conceit, and that's that understanding data is really very hard. Uh, I'm sure, so everyone here is a web developer, I assume, right? Or an aspiring web developer, and which means that you probably work with some sort of data or like data processing or data visualization or analysis in your in your day-to-day -day life. Anyone here that doesn't apply to? If you don't, get out. Just kidding. <laughs> Uh, so, the, but here's the thing, right? As as we work with increasingly large data sets over time, right? Uh, as human beings, we have very little ability actually to really understand uh, and conceptualize what that data represents. This is particularly true when we talk about when we talk about geodata. Uh, so, when you look at a whole bunch of different latitude and longitude points, for example, that represent I don't know, like the locations of stores or something like that, right? The reality is, is looking at the data, we have, abs we have absolutely no ability to uh, put that on the map, right? The, to conceptualize what that data actually means. So understanding data is very, geodata is very hard because of this thing that we call the world, right? So here's an example. This is a gigantic array of latitude and longitude points. Would anybody like to guess what this represents? Directions path, anyone else? Guesses? Anyone think they can parse this? The thing is, this means absolutely nothing. This is like complete, gar this is like complete garbage. I literally made, the, made all these data points by like smashing my hands on a number pad like over and over. Uh, and just to point out the fact that, again, like we, just, we have no ability to, to, look, to look at this data uh, it, you know, either individually as individual points or in aggregate and actually understand what what is represented by it. Um, so this is where data visualization comes in. Oh wait, actually. Oh man, this clicker is like screwing up on me. Hold on. So, and up until this point, we've basically, we've had the pin. Everyone's familiar with the pin, probably. And don't get me wrong, like we love the pin. Like, especially at, at, at Maps, like, pin's done a lot for us over the years, right? Helped us find a lot of things, get a lot of directions, do do all that all that good stuff. Um, but the honest truth is that there are limitations, right? There's there's conceptual limitations like UX considerations to the pin, where uh, once you have a whole bunch of points on the map, right? Like what what does it even actually mean to us? The the other thing is that um, who's used the Maps JavaScript API to put a map on a website before? Cool. Who has tried to put more than two or three hundred pins on the map? One, two, three, actually quite a few people. How'd that go? Probably like actually not super good, right? Like the, the total truth is, is that, be, that the implementation of our marker library runs into fairly severe uh, performance constraints once you start getting up to like two or 300. Now granted, most people are not going to need to, visual, to visualize more than two or 300 points on the map, right? Most of us are maybe doing a couple dozen at the most, but again, like as we as time goes on and we're working with bigger, larger and larger data sets, and we look at things in aggregate, for example, right? The number of cases where we actually need uh, um, to render much larger collections of data uh, increases. So this is where DeckGL comes in. So DeckGL, like I said, it's an open source framework that was built by the engineering team at Uber. As you can imagine, they probably have a lot of geodata over there that they, that they want to visualize within the context of the real world. Uh, so just a few quick points about it. It's a, web, it's a WebGL 
Power Data Visualization Framework. Uh, is everybody fam at least familiar with what WebGL is? It's okay if you raise your hand and say you're not. I, I, I can talk about it a little bit. Right. So WebGL, uh, it's, it's an open source standard. It's built, on, it's built on the OpenGL standard to mimic it as closely as possible. And what it allows you to do is to uh, basically access the GPU from, from the browser. For rendering for 2D and 3D rendering purposes is the is the common thing. So uh, WebGL is what is how uh, DeckGL gets its performance because it, it's able to push all the render off and the data processing off to the GPU. Uh, it was primarily built for a geo or an, and a mapping use case. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that you can use DeckGL for. In fact, you'll see that like there's a, you could probably imagine a lot of more generic things that you could use it for, but that's just it, it was purpose built. Uh, specifically for looking at geodata. Uh, also, takes a layer-based approach to visualization, visualization rendering. So what that means is, and you'll, you'll see later on kind of what, like, what this actually looks like, it's, it's actually layered uh, renderings on top of the map. And a cool thing is it gives us a whole bunch of really beautiful data visualizations right out, right out of the box. Uh, and I'll show like three, or if I have time, maybe four. Of, of the different ones that just come baked in to DeckGL. So this is, this is really great because it saves you a ton of time in actually making things look nice. Uh, and there's more. So like I said, this is a WebGL powered framework. So it supports really, really large data sets, like really large. Remember I said that, that uh, we currently run up against a problem with about two or 300 markers? Uh, the last time I checked, the largest data set that had been rendered on a Google map with DeckGL was 6 million. So it's a very significant uh, change. Uh, also, comes with a bunch of really nice, really nice conveniences right out of the box for us, such as the automatic handling of things like animations. I'll show you some animation stuff later on. And some things that are really important to, uh, to like UI and, and like UI design and user experience that you might not otherwise think about, like resizing. So for example, right, if you have markers on a map and somebody zooms way out, you probably actually want those markers to resize down, right? Otherwise, you're going to have these gigantic you know, icons sitting on, covering big parts of your map. So there, there's a lot of that sort of stuff. Uh, and also, it supports the building of custom layers as well. Uh, like I said, I'll show, I'll show you a bunch of, of the visualizations that, co that come ready-made uh, in DeckGL, but, uh, but the framework also exposes its underlying, uh, its underlying WebGL context. So you can pretty much do whatever you want with it if you fancy yourself being very, being very savvy uh, with WebGL. Uh, has anybody ever like, written any WebGL? Probably not like too many people, right? I wouldn't recommend it. It's like hard, like real hard. To like make a box is really hard. Uh, usually you're gonna choose something, you're gonna choose some helper framework like 3JS or something like that. Uh, like I'm serious, if I used, to have, I used to have a slide in here that showed all the code that you needed to make like a cube in WebGL and it's like a mountain of code. So, it, so that the, the, the custom layers are something that you can do. Uh, probably the thing that you would more likely do is uh, DeckGL gives you the ability to extend off of, uh, to basically subclass any existing visualization layer. So that probably what you would end up doing is taking something that's already there and kind of customizing it to, to what you want to do. And at IO this year, we. We introduced uh, initial support for the, for the framework in our Maps JavaScript API so that you could actually use it with, with Google Maps. Not going to lie, might have had a beer and, disco and discovered the fireworks transition. So, <laughs> um, so we, yeah, we, uh, we introduced initial support, which means that basically, uh, like, I think about 90% of the features of DeckGL are fully supported. Uh, with, with Google Maps currently. And it's awesome. So this uh, that you see here, not the kitty, the thing behind the kitty, is a, just a basic what's called a scatter plot visualization of all of the street trees in the city of Paris. Uh, this this uh, data comes from 
uh, a Paris open, City of Paris open data set. If you're, actually, if you're interested in playing around with DECGL or really any sort of geo, geo data, highly recommend that you, that you search for the city of your choice and the term open data, because pretty much every major and like, sub-major city in the world now has an open data program where they put out all kinds of interesting data sets that you can, that you can play with. So scatterplot layer, all it's doing, you can probably see, is putting a whole bunch of little dots on the map where, where there's a tree. Uh, and then the colors correspond to the type of tree that, that's there. So the interesting thing about this, right, is besides just kind of like looking pretty, and I mean, like, don't get me wrong, I, I, like, I like pretty things, that's kind of enough, but the, what's more interesting is that it, you get uh, like a sense of a place, right? It starts to tell you a story about all, all kinds of things, right? Like, uh, for example, things like how did a city planner Think about think about how this was all laid out, right? Uh, it gives you a, a whole new perspective on on a place. So the next question is, how does it work, right? Uh, again, everyone's a, a web developer, so you'll probably so you'll probably like this answer, which is doesn't matter. Like I don't really care how it works, to be honest. That's what frameworks are for. They the great thing about DeckGL is it extract it abstracts away a whole bunch of complexity in terms of the implementation for us and lets us just kind of get to what we want to do, which is to differentiate the design right, of, of some component of our, of our web apps. Uh, so it's just, kind of, it's just kind of awesome. But I'll, I'll also I'll give a little bit <laughs> of the how it works. Um, so the short answer is this. The way, that, the way that DeckGL works is, like I said, this is a WebGL powered uh, data visualization framework. So, it, uh, so WebGL utilizes the canvas element uh, at, as, the, as the way to insert its context, its rendering context into the DOM, and then uh, it renders into, into that canvas element. The way that that happens on top of a Google map is in our, in our JS API, we have, a, we have a, a class called overlay view. And overlay view, uh, the way that you can imagine it is it essentially puts a transparent layer uh, directly like with the Z index directly on top of on top of the map, and then syncs that layer with the with the movements of the map. Because right as you might imagine, if you're putting if you're putting an overlay of data of some kind of data visualization on top of the map, you probably want it to like move when people pan and like do things when people zoom in and out. Uh, this was actually a, a very non-trivial problem to solve. Uh, later on, I'll show a link to a blog post that the DeckGL engineering team wrote about how they were able to work with us to actually solve that problem. Uh, it gets into all kinds of like interesting but kind of boring stuff around, around issues like camera syncing. So if you're into that kind of thing, you can definitely talk about that later on. Uh, also adopts a reactive programming model for performance purposes. Uh, and I'll expl it's easier to kind of explain what that means later on when, when I show uh, like, like an animation demo. All right? So before I get started, uh, this top link it goes to uh, an app that I have running on App Engine, and you can actually see all of the demos running live. Uh, if you are on the Wi-Fi, do not go to this link right now, <laughs> because uh, one of the pitfalls of running of running demos for doing 3D visualizations of very large data sets is that it is extremely good at breaking Wi-Fi when like 100 people do it all at once. So I would not recommend, uh, if you're on the Wi-Fi, going to that right now. The second link goes to the source for that demo. Uh, and you'll see there's like, like a big chunk of, of source code for the end-to-end like, -end demo, as well as individual uh, repositories for, or in individual directories for each layer type that kind of simplify it so, to make it easier to, to digest. Right? Uh, the other thing that I always like to point out is Please notice that these links are goo.gle. I know that for the last 10 years or so, Google has, has trained us to see goo.gl links. Uh, took about 10 years of research and development, but we got the E, finally. Welcome to the future. Uh, and I cannot be held responsible for where goo.gl slash deckgl demos takes you. I have no idea. Uh, so yeah, feel free to, to check that out. Let's uh, actually look at how this thing runs. So I have a couple like basic projects here. 
Is that uh, big enough for everyone in the back to see? You can see this okay? Awesome. All right, I'm just gonna run through this real fast. So we have a few different, we have a few different uh, things that we're importing. The, fir oops. the first is Google Maps Overlay. So Google Maps Overlay is the class inside of DeckGL that actually, that actually cr uh, creates the instance of our overlay view, right? Uh, and, then, and then injects the, uh, injects the canvas element and the, and the WebGL context so that everything, everything can be rendered. Next, we have a few different layer types. So this is, this is uh, how the actual like, implementation of different visualization layers happens in DeckGL. They just, they just have these classes and you, do, and you instantiate with some options and it automatically renders inside of the WebGL context for you. And then I'm just importing some map styles. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't know that when you use, uh, when you use Google, the Google Maps APIs and SDKs, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, customize the map pretty much however you want. Like everything from the, the, uh, the resolution of different labels, so like how many different you know, place and subway labels, this sort of thing that you want, as well as the color of everything from like roads to rivers to different topographical features uh, so that you can make really pretty maps. And the thing, the thing is, right, if you're doing data visualization or I mean, if you're doing web design at all, right, like you want things to be pretty. So that's, that's an option. The way that that looks is you define, you define those customizations in a gigantic, ugly JSON blob that looks like this, which I do not recommend that you try to write yourself because it's painful. Um, instead, we have this uh, mapstyle.withgoogle.com, which is just like a styling wizard. So you can see like, right, I, if I don't want any roads to show up on the map or I want like dark mode, there's, there's like a really fine grain of different uh, different options that are available here for you to, to do styling. Cool, moving on. So we have a basic index.html file. This is pretty straightforward for everybody. There's a little bit of CSS that I put in line even though I probably should have put in a separate, full, in a separate file. Uh, there's the, the classic div with ID equals map. Probably anyone who's done maps JS before has seen this, right? This is the div where we actually like, in, where we actually insert the iframe into the DOM where we serve up the map to you, right? And then I'm just doing an include of this app.js file, which is where all the DeckGL stuff happens back here. Um, next, I have, oops, I have a variety of data sources. These are just URLs to different REST APIs for, for open data sets that come from Chicago, New York City, and Los Angeles. Um, and, then I'm and then in this script, I'm just dynamically Loading the map, loading the map script. Probably, if you've worked with Maps.js API before, you're used to seeing uh, this script tags like script async source equals you know apis.google.com or whatever. Uh, but in this case, right, DeckGL with with DeckGL, we need to know that that script has has actually uh, loaded. So this uh, this particular function is just uh, is just dynamically inserting that script element and then promise fine the whole thing so that we can be sure that, ma that the maps.js API is actually there before we run anything with DeckGL. And then I've just defined a, a function to initialize the actual map. So these are just different center points depending on which, which city I'm in, uh, as well as different zoom levels because as you're doing, diff obviously, right, as you're doing different like visualizations or you're doing different data sets in different cities, probably you want the map to load at different zoom levels that are going to kind of highlight the, the uh, view area that, that you want the user to see. So yeah, so then I just await the loading of the, of the API and then this is the basic, uh, you know, new google.maps.map that, that says go ahead create an instance of the map, load it into the DOM, show it to the user, right? Make sense? Pretty straightforward? Cool. So down here, this is, where the, this is where the app actually runs. So I'm just doing that map initialization. And then I'm creating an instance of Google Maps overlay. Again, remember this is where, this is where that overlay view is actually created, right? And injected. And then 
Uh, there's actually a number of different properties that you can get uh, that you can give when you instantiate the the when you instantiate Google Maps overlay. The one that we really care about for the purposes of this is just layers. So you'll notice layers is actually an array, right? I'm only putting one thing in the array right now. Again, just to keep things kind of simple and easy to view. Uh, but and then and then the array takes a set of of layer of different visualization layer instances. Okay, so the cool thing about this though is that because it's an array, you can actually uh, composite uh, different different visualizations. So this is this is good for a number of things, right? Like you may want to sort of make, like put multiple different visualizations overlaid on the same map to create some kind of effect, or you might uh, also use this for performance reasons. Because if you can imagine, if I was to load a million data points over HTTP. That's probably pretty slow. Uh, so there's various, there's various uh, strategies for how you can handle the performance of this. So for example, you could, com you could chunk your data set and then composite it as multiple layers, as an example. Right? So this one is a basic scatter plot layer, which is like the city of Paris one that I showed you. Every layer has an ID. Uh, I'll get more into that later on. It doesn't really matter to this particular uh, instance, but it'll matter later on. Every, every layer has to have a unique ID, right? Then I give it whatever its data source is. So interesting thing here to notice, right, is remember that, th that data sources.nyc was just a URL. There's actually a whole different variety of, of data sources that you can feed into DeckGL. Like you can, you can pull in a local JSON file, which I may do to try not to, br to break the Wi-Fi. Uh, or at, at, like CSV, also the, probably the most common is you want to pull in the data from some REST API, right? Uh, so in this case, the, the neat thing is I just give it a URL. It recognizes that this is a URL, and it, and it orchestrates the HTTP request and, and awaits it for me automatically. It's like a small thing, but really convenient. Uh, then we have a whole, different, a whole set of just styling options for the layer. So whether or not there's opacity, whether or not there's opacity on the points, if they're stroked, what the fill color is, all of this. This is a very short list of the possible, uh, the possible styling uh, settings you can have for for a layer, and, and all the layers have a bunch. Uh, so another thing to note is we have like this radius min pixels, max pixels. That was that dynamic resizing that I was talking about. So the, these two properties are setting, you know, as I zoom in, what's the big, what's the biggest that the points we'll get, and as I zoom out, what's the smallest that I'm willing to let them be. So you have a lot of fine grain control. Uh, the next thing to point out is this get position. So basically every layer, right, you're, you're pulling in the data set, but obviously DeckGL doesn't know like where in that JSON blob that's coming back from the, from the API to actually look for its lat long points, right, that it wants to render. So this is where you actually tell it where in the returned object to look. So you can see this is a function. And it's just, it's just iterating every line of an array of data points, right? And then pulling the, pulling, you know, the coordinates that, it wants to that you want it to render from there. Does that make sense? And then here, like, get fill color, get line color. I'm, I'm not dynamically setting the color. But also, just to point out that a lot of these properties will, will accept either a static value or they'll or they'll accept a function so that you can dynamically set. So like when you saw that Paris one where they were all different trees, uh, for example, like you could do that here, right? You could say, you could just have like a ternary operator or some sort of conditional that says if tree type equals X, then color Y, right? So that creates my instance of Google Map, or Google Maps overlay, and then I just call set map on that and give it the instance of the actual, of the actual map div. And so all that's doing is, is telling DeckGL to, uh, this, this is the actual map that I want to pin this overlay to. Cool? So let's see what that does. Oops. So I just like, have a basic Webpack dev server set up here. There you go. This is like uh, 17,000 data points that loaded that quickly. And when you look at it, again, it performs really well, right? It goes all the way down to the ground. 
So quite a big difference from the limitation of two, two or 300,000. Uh, and again, I always like to point out that this kind of tells you something about a place. So this is street trees in New York City. Um, what do you think this big empty area in the middle is? It's Times Square. Have you ever been to Times Square? Not a lot of trees growing there. Uh, same thing down here, right, in lower Manhattan. This is Wall Street, right? Not a lot of, not a lot of trees growing around the banks, <laughs> turns out. Um, cool. So let's look at another one. So I'm going to uh, save you all the pain of watching me live code boilerplate. And I'm going to use the, mir the miracle of copy and paste. Everyone here is a JavaScript. Everyone here is a developer, so don't lie. I know you copy and paste. I do it too. Um, so this, this next one is called an arc layer. And what an arc layer is made for is to, is to visualize the connection between an origin and a destination point as a three-dimensional arc. All right? So you can imagine like you've probably seen visualizations before of like an airport, right? And all of the, all of the flights leaving the airport to their destinations. They're, this is the sort of thing that arc layer is, is made for. Again, has its unique ID. I give it the data source. In this case, it needs two different, um, two different setters to tell it where to find both the origin point and the destination point. Some basic, some basic styling, like the width of the arc. And that's it. Oh wait, sorry, let me change one more thing because this one is actually in Chicago. And this is what we get from this one. So this is uh, like, I don't know, like 30,000 uh, arcs rendered, which looks kind of cool. Um, but it's a little bit hard to actually tell what's going on here, right? Because it's a lot of different uh, data points or a lot of different arcs all overlaid on top of each other, right? The reason why I like to show this one, though, is, is that this is kind of neat and kind of impressive because like, that's a lot of data. But what's really neat is when you do this. So yeah, this is a uh, yeah. This is thirty thousand arcs that are individually rendered in three dimensional space, and totally perform totally performs well. Uh, and again, you can go all the way down to the ground, which is kind of neat. I've seen people do really interesting composite effects with this as well. Like I was at a hackathon and a guy, uh, he he took all of this on time and late departure data for flights. And he had on-time flights uh, as white and late flights as red lines. And then when they were all overlaid on top of each other, you could tell the, uh, the relative on-time rate of, of an airport based on how pink or red it was. So these are the sorts of things that you can imagine doing with like composite effects, right? Nice. Um, cool. We have just a little bit more time. So oh, the, this, this data is actually taxi rides in the city of Chicago. Uh, it's a big, uh, like obviously the city of Chicago, Chicago is not going to like show people going door to door. So it's like centroids of neighborhoods. So it's like all of the people going from O'Hare to neighborhood X. Um, if it was actually going door to door, then like you'd have lines all over the place. It'd be crazy looking. <laughs> cool. Uh, so the next one that I want to show is, oops is what is called a TRIPS layer. So when we, when we talk about geodata, right, often it's not just like static, it's not just like static in time, right? We want to look at data that's moving through the world over some, some time period, right? So TRIPS layer is purpose built for this. So if you can imagine wanting to, for example, look at, uh, I don't know, you have a fleet of delivery trucks, right? And you want to see how they, how they all moved relative to one another at the same time, right? So, so TRIPS layer does, and does a time-based animation of geodata, all right? This, this one is just a little bit different. Same sort of thing, though. Um, I'm importing my Google Maps overlay. Actually, I don't need this one. I keep forgetting to take this, uh, this line out. <laughs> I have the TRIPS overlay and my map styling. So. The way that, that I've set this particular, uh, this particular demo up is I use our Places API to just do a fetch of restaurants around a center point on the map, 
Okay, so that returns me 10 different places, right, with their location data. And then I use our directions API to, to just generate routes that join each, each point to the other nine. So that gives me like 190 uh, different sets of, sets of directions, okay? Um, so this is, the, oops. Yeah, so this function here is just where I'm generating that place data out of, out of the places API. And then here in these two functions, I'm just uh, generating the directions and then building those all into arrays, okay? Same thing as before, I load, I load the maps API, I initialize my map, and then uh, real quick, I'm gonna come down here. So the, so the API loads, initialize the map, I get my places, right? I generate my, my trips, okay? And then I, I create an instance of Google Maps overlay. So in this case, you'll see that unlike last time, right, I'm just, create, I'm just instantiating the overlay with nothing inside of it, so it's, it's empty right now, right? It's just a blank, uh, transparent uh, overlay with, with a WebGL context inside of it. And again, calling set map. The difference is I'm gonna call this render function. So up here, I have this render function, and on the overlay, I call set props. So set props is how you can change a, uh, a DeckGL uh, overlay, uh, re like uh, recursively. So for example, you know, right, you don't often want to, or there's many times where you're not going to want to just do the one visualization and then just have it do nothing else, right? You want it, usually you're trying to show some sort of change, right, or some sort of variation. Uh, so this is what set props is for. So you can see that what I'm doing is passing, passing it a layer, right? Which is an instance of this trips layer. Again, there's an ID, there's data, right? and then a path. The data set for, for a trips layer, what it looks like is, so imagine you have a set of directions, right? And you have the turn by turn directions. So each turn, right, is at a latitude and longitude point, and there's a timestamp associated with it. Make sense? So what, de what, what, uh, what DeckGL does with, in this particular case is it takes this array of all the turn by turns with, with their timestamps, and it animates, the, it animates the movement between points. For us, that's a very good. That's a very good question. So the question is, does that mean that that I create a new trips layer on every render? So I'll, I'll get to this in just a second, actually. Um, again, right? We have various uh, settings for what it looks like, and then you can see that I have this current time property in trips layer, and I'm every time I render, I'm incrementing current time, and then I'm recursively calling render with request animation frame. So this is the interesting thing about the, about the reactive programming model that, that's adopted by, by DeckGL, is that, uh, remember I had said the ID has to be unique? So, what, so every time you, you uh, give DeckGL an instance of a layer, it will use that ID to identify whether or not it has already rendered this layer once. And then, if it, if it has, it will, uh, only do a shallow diff on the, on the previous version of the layer versus the new version that you're giving it. This means that, for example, uh, you know, if it's already rendered out the data, it knows the data set hasn't changed. So it only has to change maybe some sort of particular uh, visualization property, right? Some sort of like styling property. Uh, so in this case, right, the only thing that's changing over time is, this cur is the timestamp on this current time, which tells it where in time to animate. Too. So, uh, real quick, I just have I have a little node server running in the background that just orchestrates all of that like places and direction stuff for me to make it a little bit quicker. Npm run start. I think this is what I had it as. Yeah. Awesome. So let's just like give it a second for it to like spin up all the data, and that's what we get. So this, again, right, this is 190 like trips in motion, all relative 
to one another. And the cool thing is, this is running at 60 frames per second. Not only does, does so I'm only incrementing current time by like one second at a time, right? But for every frame that I ask DeckGL to render, it actually also renders three to four in-betweens for me as well. So I get these like really nice smooth animations. Uh, it's pretty cool. I've done this, I've done this with like 20,000 data points or something like that before. Um, another like neat little thing I like to point out is like, I don't know, let's change the color and make the length of the trails a little bit different and render it again. And you can see like, like your perception of the visualization like really changes based on, you know, your UI, like based on your styling decisions. Um, that's pretty cool because, right, all the way down to the ground. Uh, if, you, if you actually have the link with the demo that I had posted before, if you run the trips layer, I have, I have it where it just continues to grow basically forever. Uh, so you end up with a lot of different lines moving around the map. Again, the, these are the links. Uh, oop, if you want to see it and run it for yourself. Uh, the, all of these demos are made so you can run them on localhost. You can just run npm start, basically. Uh, we, have some, we have some really good docs for the Maps platform. Uh, also, this link goes directly to the part of the DeckGL docs that talk about Google Maps overlay. Uh, and this is that blog post where, that I told you about earlier where they discuss how they actually made this implementation happen. Uh, oh, we just started a new, a new YouTube channel too. So if you're interested in maps, check it out. Uh, we, we, we're posting a bunch of videos and stuff there. Uh, we would love to hear what it is that, that you'd like to see as well. That's it. Uh, again, that's my Twitter handle. Thank you very much.